Good morning, friends, and welcome to Christ Church Parish. Our community begins the new church year as we worship together. It would be good for you to go ahead and print out a bulletin so that you can follow along, particularly because we're using texts from Enriching Our Worship, our church's attempt to make a larger and more inclusive language for prayer. And so some of the prayers will be different from what you've learned in the past. It might also be good to have one of the Advent wreath lighting ceremonies. I hope that you'll join us on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. and we'll do a Zoom Advent wreath lighting and families from the parish will take part in it. Today we light the first candle for Advent, the Advent candle for hope. This time of the year, darkness comes early. We can lose our hope in the darkness. Lighting a candle in the darkness can help us find our way. When we cannot see where we have been or where we are going, a single candle, flickering bright, can help us to find our way again. The psalmist sings, Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. One candle, see it glow bringing hope that all may know how one candle shows the way, making our darkness bright as God's day. Restore us, O oh God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Loving God, on this first Sunday of Advent, let the light of hope shine brightly. As the daylight grows shorter, make us ready for the day when your face will shine upon us at Christmas. In our Savior Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us join in heart and voice with the opening hymn. Our opening hymn is number 57, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Blessed are you, holy and living one. You come to your people and set them free. And we pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. God be with you, and let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility. That in the last day, <coughs> he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, and may rise to the life immortal, through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us be attentive to the words of Holy Scripture. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you, who works for those who wait for him. You need those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourselves, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our inequities, like the wind, takes us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember inequity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7 and 16 through 18, responsibly by verse as found in your bulletin. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock, shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your confidence, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us life, that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. The Epistle, a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, 
because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, know that he is near at the very gates. 
Very truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware and keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of our living, loving, and liberating God. Amen. Take a nice deep breath, my friends. First breath of Advent. Breathing in God's great gifts and giving thanks for another, yet another kind of strange year. I thought this year as we anticipate the birth of Jesus, we would do well to think about the scriptures that were evident before Jesus came. The scriptures that were in use. Uh, we're accustomed to bringing out our Bibles with Old Testament and New Testament, 66 books of the Bible, plus or minus the Apocrypha. We're, we're used to having a New Testament that tells us the good news of Jesus, including all the stories leading up to Jesus' birth and the moments on from there. But at the time of Jesus, there was only the Hebrew Scripture, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, the Torah, which explained how God commanded the world to be, the Prophets, who explained how we needed to get back to the way the world should be, and the writings, which added additional understanding about the wisdom that comes from God. Mark's Gospel doesn't really care much about the preparatory things before Jesus was born, or even the preparatory things going up to Jesus' life. Mark's Gospel begins immediately with a 30-year-old Jesus appearing before John the Baptist and being baptized and going about his work. And so this season in particular, this year in particular, as we begin the year of Mark, is a good time for us to look at the Hebrew Scriptures, the Scriptures that would have been common to everyone who was awaiting the coming of Messiah. And it turns out that this year, the first three Old Testament, the first three Hebrew Scripture lessons that we have from the prophet Isaiah offer us a complete understanding a large view of what that expectation was. All three of the passages are written in what scholars call Second Isaiah, from chapter 40 through chapter 66, a second restatement by a different group of people, maybe even a hundred years after the prophet Isaiah lived. But the stories are gathered in such a way that we can become involved in the stories. And the hopes that they experience may well be like the hopes that we experience. Because in this time of 2nd Isaiah, everything seemed turned on its head. God's people had been taken off in exile. The Babylonians had come, conquered Jerusalem, burned the city down, and hauled people off into exile. But by the writing of 2nd Isaiah, the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. And Cyrus the Persian had decreed that all God's people should go back to their own homelands, and as long as they paid tribute, they could continue as vassal states. And so God's people went back. And Isaiah 64, which we read today, is written in a destroyed, badly mauled Jerusalem, where people within the city are arguing about what to do to rebuild. The pious Sadducees wanted the temple rebuilt. The religious political leaders wanted the government reestablished, and so there was infighting back and forth, and it seemed like, well, everything was turned on its head. There was no place to worship, no place to gather, no place of agreement. And so Isaiah 64, which Klaus Westermann 50 years ago said was the most poignant lament in all of the scriptures, begins with a cry to God. 
Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and come down. That longing for God's presence runs deep within God's people, particularly in times of exile, in times of wandering, in times of dis disbursement because of disease. We ask God to come down and be among us because of the wounds we feel, because of the difficulties we struggle with, not simply of a disease that's around us, but all of the impacts that go along with that, the loss of community, the loss of jobs, the loss of time for our children to be together. Oh God, would you come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as the fire kindles the brushwood, make your name known so the nations might tremble at your power. But it doesn't stop there. Because once you've asked, you must ask yourself then, well, what it is that we're asking God to do? The Jewish people are very good at their memory. They're very good at remembering what God has done. When they gather in community, time after time, they remember. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you. The defining moment for Israel was, of course, at Mount Sinai, when liberated from the Egyptians, liberated from the oppression and slavery that they had known, they come before God and are given their commandments. And the mountains quaked there as they gathered at Sinai, but they remembered that God came down. God came among them. No one had ever experienced a God coming into their midst. No ear had ever heard it. No eye had ever seen it. Those who wait for God can experience. Here's the heart of Advent, friends. We are waiting for God. In some ways, we've been in Advent since March. It's, it's practically a pregnancy. It's practically Mary's pregnancy, which begins with the Annunciation back in March and goes all the way through to December. We have been in a time of waiting, waiting for a vaccine waiting for the chance to hug the people that we love, waiting for the ability to travel and work and do the things that we care about. But God meets those who do right, and God works for those who wait for him. It's part of our time in this season of Thanksgiving that we remember that God has been on our side from the beginning. God has made us in love and called us to be loved and asks us to love into the world. We must remember again and again as we wait. The people of Isaiah's day didn't just remember, though. They also came to a realization. They realized the brokenness of the society around them. Hopelessness and helplessness are the third piece of this great song of entreaty. You were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. It must have been devastatingly hard to walk in what used to be the streets of Jerusalem. It must have been devastatingly hard to confront the people who didn't go off in exile, who had muddled through trying to put a few grapevines together and raise a few sheep so that they would have food. It must have been incredibly difficult to remember that the temple was there and the horn was sounded and that people brought their offerings with great thanksgiving. But it all seemed to have faded. They all seemed to have lost the sense of who God was. And their own iniquities, their own sin, their own brokenness had pulled them further and further away from God. Now, I am not one to equate illness with sin, but I do recognize how people turn their backs on God. 
I am not one who equates the pandemic that we have as some kind of judgment that God is putting on us. But I do think that how we operate in the pandemic reflects how we understand God. Our care for others is more important than simply pushing to push ourselves back together as a community. Our care for each other is more important than our desire to go out and do as we would do. In this time of Advent, it's important to look at the ways that our own personal behaviors may have broken covenant with God, may have broken the love and the sharing that God has provided us, but we have turned our back on him. But we don't get left there. We don't get left in a place of difficulty or shame or embarrassment or loneliness or abandonment. The final words, yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. Here's the basic thing, friends. We are God's children. God is our source. The hands that you have, the eyes that you see with, the ears that you use to hear, they are all part of God's creation. We are the clay, and God is the potter who molds us through adversity and through times of great success. God is the potter who molds this community to reach out to others with arms of love. We are the work of God's hands. And in Advent, we begin to look at ourselves and say, how is it that we are here? Why is it that we are here? For whom is it that we are here? God will not remember our iniquity forever. If we ask for the forgiveness, God grants it. And now we are all God's people. Isaiah 64 is not a passage that immediately bubbles up to mind, but I want to encourage you to look at it again and again this week. Oh, that you would come down, split the heavens, and be in our midst. Oh, we remember how you did it in the past. Oh, we remember how we have broken covenant. Oh, we remember that we are the work of God's hands. That's the work of Advent, friends. That's what we're here about. One of my heroes is a woman who writes blessings for a living. Jan Richards' book, Circle of Grace, has blessings for every season of the year. Jan recognizes that in this season we see both the brokenness of a world that is ending and the beginning of a new world. Quoting from Mark's gospel, which we heard today, when the sun will be darkened and the powers of heaven will be shaken, she writes a blessing for when the world is ending. My hope is that this blessing might reside within you and your household and those whom you love. A blessing when the world is ending. Look, the world is always ending somewhere. Somewhere the sun has come crashing down. Somewhere it has gone completely dark. Somewhere it has ended with the gun, the knife, the fist. Somewhere it has ended with the slammed door and the shattered hope. Somewhere it has ended with the utter quiet that follows the news from the phone the television, the hospital room. Somewhere it has ended with a tenderness that will break your heart. But listen, this blessing means to be anything but morose. It does not come to cause despair. It is here simply because there is nothing a blessing is better suited for than an ending. Nothing that cries out more for a blessing than when the world is falling apart. This blessing will not fix you. It will not mend you. It will not give you false comfort. It will not talk to you about one door opening when another door closes. It will simply sit itself beside you among the shards and gently turn your face in the direction from which the light will come, gathering itself about you as the world begins. May this Advent be a time of new beginning for you, a time when you recognize how much God loves you, what God has done for you, how God calls you to new life, and the fact that you are clay in the potter's hand. Amen. 
you'll want to have the bulletin handy as we do the Nicene Creed. As I've said at the beginning of this, we are gathering around the uh, enriching our worship text. In 1994, the General Convention improved or approved uh, changes to the Nicene Creed to reflect the way that it was originally proposed. And so the words that seem different aren't typos or mistakes. They are part of the General Convention's direction that we move back in the direction of the original text of the Nicene Creed. Will you join me as we say to our faith together? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with one heart and mind as we await the coming of Christ, let us offer the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people are found in your bulletin. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the services of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died and that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that you may share with all your saints in your internal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and gracious Father, we give you thanks for the fruits of the earth in their season, for the labors of those who harvest them. Make us, we pray, faithful stewards of your great bounty, for the provision of our necessities and the relief of all who are in need, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. 
forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you, and remember in your hearts those whom we cannot see today. As the season of Advent begins, we bring to this table our hopes for the year to come, our commitment to piety and worship and acts of kindness and grace. Here at this table, we spread before God the concerns of our lives. Here at this table, we spread before God our thanksgiving for all that God has given. Join me now as we prepare for a spiritual communion. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And let us give thanks for the saving death and resurrection of Jesus and ask him to be with us now. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask that you come spiritually into my heart. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. In a blessing for the season of Advent, a triple blessing that has three amens before the final word. May Almighty God, by whose providence our Savior Christ came among us in great humility, sanctify you with the light of God's blessing and set you free from all sin. Amen. May Christ, whose second coming in power and great glory we await, make you steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. May you who rejoice in the first advent of our Redeemer at Christ's second coming be rewarded with eternal life. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer be upon you today and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is soon and very soon as found in your bulletin. A link to the bulletin can be found in the video description below. We'll be singing verses one through three.
Friends, I am so grateful that we get to gather together virtually each week to continue our prayer, our praise, and our thanksgiving. I'm deeply grateful to Gary Van Essen and the choir for the amazing music that they put together every week, for our lectors and intercessors who say the prayers and read scriptures, and I'm so grateful that we get to be a people gathered even as we're separate because of the virus. And there's another chance for worship today at 5 p.m. and every Sunday during Advent at 5 p.m. when we will gather by Zoom for a virtual Advent wreath lighting ceremony. The uh, bulletin for that is on the parish website, so you can go and find it. And whether you actually have an Advent wreath home or not, you can still be a part of this wonderful thing as our young children get to experience the countdown for the days until Christmas. We're living well through Advent uh, through the Zoom meeting that will gather, helping us to talk about hope together. Uh, we've got booklets at the church, or you can download a booklet for yourself. There's even a Kindle version of Living Well through Advent. Check the parish website or the, uh, bull the newsletter that's coming out for more information about Living Well through Advent on Tuesday nights on Zoom. Every Sunday during Advent, we've got something special going on. Next Sunday, December 6th, we're going to do online Christmas caroling at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And on Saturday, December the 12th, the Westminster Ringers are going to offer a virtual concert. Of course, our longest night service will be on the 20th. We ask that you continue to be as generous as you can in giving for the backpack program and for our work in Graysonville. Hunger is a real thing all around us today, and the more that we can do to support each other, the better. Soups and Salad Ministries are continuing to do a very disciplined and safe way to share our food with the neighbors who want to buy food. You can go on the website to learn more about Soup and Salad Ministry. Lastly, thanks to all of you who have turned in your pledge cards. We're beginning to get a sense of how the budget will be built for 2021. And if you've not yet turned in a card, it's still not too late. Let us know so that we can make our plans to build for the future. We've gathered together to ask the Lord's blessing, and the Lord has blessed us. And now I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace today and every day of Advent, Christmas, and beyond. God bless, friends.